We've got some super special news today. What if I told you that we can finally solve, is this a normal, once and for all? What if I told you that you could tell if a snake was het for a recessive attribute? 100%, no questions asked, absolutely guaranteed. This is the Reptile Information Review. By the end of this video, you'll be amazed at what this news is. If you remember one of the previous videos that we did, we talked about morph math. That was telling you how to predict what your snakes had a chance of being. We covered in that video the entire premise that if you have a Mendelian trait, which is pretty much every gene and something like ball pythons, same thing for corn snakes, same thing for sand boas, on and on and on and on. So if you have these Mendelian traits, then you know that 50% of the offspring of that parent will have that trait. Now there is a little bit of argument there. So this is probability, right? And I did get some feedback from that video where people were upset and confused that, oh, you can't say 50% of the offspring, you can't say 50% of the clutch, uh, and just came up with some really wacky ideas. But just to knock that out of the way, just as a thought experiment, consider flipping a coin. So if you flip a coin one time and you get heads, that coin is still not 100% probability for heads. It's still 50% chance. If you flip that coin 100 times, it's true that you may get 46 heads, you may get 60 heads, you may get 100 heads, but the probability is mind-blowing for that one. The concept there is that we know these genes are packed inside of a chromosome and a chromosome from each parent has an equal 50% chance to be passed out. So whether we say each egg is 50% chance of having a specific trait, or if you say the clutch or the offspring have 50% chance of having that trait, it's really at the end of the day, it's the same. It's the same. But anyway, so let's fast forward to the great news of the day. So we know that if you have incomplete dominance, most of those are characterized by having a different phenotype. So you look directly at the animal and you know it's not normal. There are also recessive traits, which are a little bit trickier. In recessive traits, you don't have any indication that that animal actually has that trait. So that's where it gets a little bit complicated. That animal has to have a pair of traits in order for that recessive gene to have an effect on the phenotype. So we look at a, a, one that's common across a lot of different animals, albinism. So an albino parent that is crossed with a normal parent will have babies that are het albino. Everybody knows this, great. You won't see any actual visual albinos. Now, of course, if you took two visual albinos, paired them together, you'd have all visual albinos. If you took a visual albino and a het albino, you will have 50% albinos. The little tiny babies that you see on the screen were actually produced by a visual lavender albino, yellow belly, and that was paired to a confusion het lavender albino. Kind of hard to see in this little noodle pile, but we pretty much split evenly. There are seven total snakes here. Three of them have the wild type coloration, non-albino, I guess you would say. Uh, and then the other four are all albinos. There's a couple other genes here floating. As I mentioned, there's confusion in yellow belly, of course. But for this, we're specifically talking about the recessive trait. Now it is well, well known that people always want to know if I paired two hets, which one of these animals actually are het for this trait? And you'll see different pairings and different lineages, 66%, 33%, 50%, all these numbers all over the board when you go and you browse something like Morph Market or something like that. We know that not all of those babies are carrying that recessive trait. They are not het for that recessive trait, but some are. So how do we find out which ones are actually het? There are some myths on the internet that, you know, oh, well, if you have a certain scale in a certain place or a certain line of scales under the tail, then it's clown. Uh, if you have really, you know, deep railroad tracks or tram lines, then it's pied. But none of these markers are really 100%. They're not guaranteed. You shouldn't actually try to sell a snake based on whether or not it has tram lines or anything like that. So it's, there's not really a good way to decide, is this lavender albino, but a het? Is this piebald, but a het? Is a clown, but a het? On and on and on and on. They all will pretty much look normal. 
And of course, when I say normal, I mean they just don't have that recessive trait expressed in their phenotype. They can, of course, have incomplete dominance, everything else. I'm rambling here, but you get the idea. However, students over at East Michigan have started a ball python genetics project, and they have been working on this for a while. This is something that I've followed and been extremely interested in. We're going to take a small segue to also remind you of another video that we've made previously, specifically about nidovirus. Inside of that video, we talked about a method for detecting DNA called PCR. In that video, we mentioned that PCR is able to detect any piece of DNA that you choose. If you know the sequence, PCR can amplify it, which allows us to detect it. That works to identify nidovirus, which technically is not DNA, but during transcription, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's another pedantic thing. It's fine. Uh, so PCR can find any piece of DNA in the case of nidovirus, it could find that virus in the case of these traits, the students have isolated individual sequences that are related to these traits. So the same test that can protect our animals from disease is the same test that can actually tell us if these animals are hit for certain traits. This project has gone on for a while. They've received uh, shed just shed skin from snakes that have been sent in and all of these students have been working and been really busy uh, doing PCR tests to try to find the sequences and identify those sequences. Now what's also interesting about PCR is this is technically something you could do at home. It's a lot safer than trying to do PCR for, for nidovirus or pathogen or something like that at home of course. In this instance all you're looking for is DNA. There's nothing infectious or anything like that. So if you head over to minipcr.com or another place like that, you can actually get a kit that will allow you to do PCR at home. Of course, you need the sequences. And that's what really makes the project that the students over in East Michigan have started really, really, really exciting. You can actually help the research. All it takes is shed skin delivered to the address that you can find in the links below for the students to use to be able to further their research. The animals that you've seen appear uh, are noodles that are just recently hatched out. And as soon as they have their first shed, those are going in an envelope and I'm sending those off to the students as soon as possible. They're looking for shed skin from any genes that they've already discovered, as well as any genes that you have in your collection. Really exciting time where you can actually work to do some research with reptiles that will result in something that will change the industry as a whole, as well as science. As of right now, they were able to take the genome from a Burmese python. Why a Burmese python, you ask? Because we don't actually have a complete sequence for a ball python. Really crazy, right? Uh, if you go and look at sites like GenBank, which I mean is something that no ball python owner has ever heard of. So we'll just take a quick mention of that one. Um, if you head over there, then you can find a complete sequence for a Burmese python, but you won't find a complete sequence for a ball python. So using the frame of a Burmese python, they were able to locate the sequence, the start and end of the sequence of the ball python, and then locate coding genes based on annotations from the Burmese python and find the coding genes for very specific traits. If that wasn't interesting enough, they also reference the human genome and how albinism affects humans and found that those were the same genes causing color morphs in ball pythons. Describing a morph as albino, they found out that it was actually made up of two different molecular alleles. Some of the albinos were only carrying one, some were carrying both, some of the animals that people identified as candies turned out to be albino. Some that people said were only albino turned out to be candy. It's an extremely interesting project that everybody that has even considered owning a ball python should be interested in. But it does require you to read. This type of technology has the ability to completely change the way the animal trade works for these animals. So just like we can remove disease and screen for disease with these simple tests, we'll now be able to start to verify morphs with these simple tests. 
there will be no more 66%. There will be no more people listing snakes as proven breeders that are still 66%, some trait. You can actually get a genetics test done and find out if they're actually het for that trait. Now, of course, this project is not going to isolate all the thousands of different morphs that there are for ball pythons, but definitely albinism is, is covered and of plenty of people out there have things like pied. So as this project receives different sheds for all of these animals, they might be able to compile a database for all of the common traits that we're looking for. No more 66% clowns, you'll be able to DNA test for it. No more 50% het pieds, you'll be able to DNA test for it. And they've already started with desirable traits like lavender albino and ultramel. This is completely earth shattering news or should be earth shattering news for anybody interested in ball pythons. I'll link the East Michigan project down in the description below, of course. But what if I told you that's not the only project that's working on something like this? There's a paper that you can find in the links below that is from McGill University and Genome Quebec Innovation Center in Montreal, Canada, where uh, they actually went and contacted Billy over at Mutation Creation and received tons of samples from him. Really neat that they collaborated with a breeder of ball pythons in order to further research in how these genes actually become prevalent in these species. Some of the other places that they were able to crowdsource from was T.Dot Exotics, The Ballroom Canada, Designing Morphs, and as we already mentioned, Mutation Creation. This is a really, really exciting thing. We've got two different places working to isolate and look at the way that these, these genetics are working. And not only that, but it's proven to be helpful in finding links to the way that those mutations are passed through other animals, including humans. I can't be more excited about something like this. We've got universities working directly with breeders to learn more about the way that genetics works. And it all starts with ball pythons. So just to reiterate that, this is real researchers working with topics inside of ball pythons for research that can not only help us as a hobby to do things like identify which of our animals are het for ultramel, but also further that science in other areas. This isn't people copying Wikipedia. This isn't people eating calcium sand. This isn't people making wacky doodle claims about vitamin D and COVID-19 or somebody else with a tinfoil hat claiming the who is wrong about vitamin D. There's none of that complete and utter nonsense real science in our hobby that is going to have a significant impact on the hobby. This is really exciting news. What do you think? Are you a ball python owner that thinks that your animal might be het pied? Are you a breeder that's interested in finding out ahead of time before you spend the extra time and resources with an animal that may not be het pied or het ultramel or het lavender albino? How would this change the way that you work with these animals? Are you already taking advantage of cheap PCR tests that are used with other species to identify what sex they are or whether or not they have specific diseases such as nidovirus? Are you interested in using PCR in this manner to confirm genes inside of your animals? Let me know in the comments below.